Hello everyone, and welcome back to this next video in the eHoudini Academy Foundation module. In this video, we are going to continue where we left off last time and update the rest of the visualizer and also do a bit of cleanup. So next, let's go ahead and work on the readout for our actual state of the tool, right? And this will involve a little bit of VEX, but it's not too complicated. It just takes a little bit of um, attention. So. Let's go to Houdini. And what I would like to do is over here, right, let's say above where we have our visualizer output, let's create a new netbox right there. And I'm going to call this one the props output visualizer. So this one is going to be a text-based visualizer that's going to sit about right there in the minus X direction. In this case, you can decide where you want it to be. It can be in any direction of the tool. Um, I'm going to use minus X in this case. So let's go ahead and add a font node first. So over here, I can drop down a font node. I'm going to call this one um, props info text and then inside of its field we want to add a couple of variables that we can then read out as text on the node now the problem is that standard expressions aren't very flexible and i don't want to create a very complicated expression in this field especially not inside of a text field like a string field so what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to create an attribute wrangle node. In that wrangle node, I'm going to create a couple of attributes, string attributes. And then I'm going to read it back in to this text node, this font node, in order to display the text. But there is going to be some static text that we need to have. So let's first set this one up and then we can start working on the actual content of our uh, readout. So I'm going to type in here props output status. Then let's add a line below that like so. And then below this, I'm going to add a dash. And then anything below this point is going to be from the wrangle node. But this will already give us some text that we can work with. And at this moment, it's um, really not in the right place. So let's give it the correct location, scale and rotation, right? So in order to get the correct position for this text, um, I want to grab the bounding box of my current building. So that should be the bounding box of this. And then I'm just going to position it right outside of it against the top at the back, right in the minus X direction. Um, now to give this a better visual on where it's going to be, I'm going to go over here to my collision which is a accurate enough representation of my building. And I'm going to create a bound node. Now the bound node by default will simply create a bounding box around whatever object you feed it. And it's going to be in the cardinal directions by default, which is fine for us, right? So here's our building. And as you can see, it's enveloping it inside of a bounding box. Um, and then you can actually go ahead and add some padding to it if you want. So you can add some extra space on any of the sides, or you can even change it into another shape, like for example, a sphere if you want to, but that's not what I want. So let's keep it at a box. And then um, I'm going to color this blue and I'm going to reference this from my, let's see over here, our text node. So let's add a new spare input and let's type dollar slash bound one. So that should now create that link. And then let's set this text up so it sits right there. Okay. So um, we want it to be, if I can see the little gnomon here in the corner, in the negative x direction. So that's going to be bounding box minus one 
um, and then d underscore x min for the minimum position on our building. Now I do want it to sit a little bit away from the building, so I'm going to just subtract two from that as well. So it sits just that little bit further. Then let's take this text and let's move it up to the top of the building as well. So let's grab the bounding box again. And let's say D underscore Y max. So that should now position it on top of our building, right? And um, then I'm just going to rotate it. So let's say I rotate it by about 90 degrees like that and also sit it on its side. So minus 90 on X, that should work. Um, now at the moment it is centered on my building. You can choose how you want it to um, sit on your building where you want it to be located. I'm going to move it over to the left right there. So I'm going to grab my bounding box expression again. And let's say Z max for this one, um, like so. And then I'm going to horizontally align it to the left and also to the bottom. And what this will do now is if we add additional lines of text to our text field, it will simply stretch the text away from our building. So no matter on how much text we have, it will always sit against the building, but it will never overlap. And you can customize this as you want to. You can decide where you want it to be, um, if you want it to be centered or on the side, um, but this is how I'm gonna set it up. And then let's just double check the size of our text, because by default, uh, font nodes are very dense on detail. So I'm just going to bring our detail down to 0 0.001 like before, and that will do. Okay, so now that we have this, um, let's go ahead and plug this up so we can see it on the outside of our tool as well as part of our visualizer. Let's add a color node behind this. I'm just going to color this bright blue. So grab the blue color and boost it to two. And now I should be able to watch it in my viewport um, without having to watch it in wireframe. And then finally, um, let's add a new null node here. Call this one out props output visualizer. And then we can just go ahead and plug this in over here as well. Now again, I want to be able to turn this one on or off. So I'm simply going to add this toggle to my interface. Let's um, open up the type properties, scroll down to our prop section, and I'm going to grab our enable merge six toggle, drag it over and let's give it a name. So let's say we call this vent um, status visualizer. And for this one too. And I'm just going to make sure it's turned off by default. So um, we don't have that readout the moment we spawn our tool. We only need it when we start working with the props. Okay, so now we should have the ability to view this on the outside of our tool as well. Let's just go to the parameter panel, turn it on. Okay, there we go. So um, yeah, we now have our readout and we can enable or disable it. Now let's actually go ahead and add our wrangle node so we can bring information into this readout, right? So let's create an attribute wrangle here. And I'm going to um, color this one purple. And let's name it the prop info wrangle. Now in this case, I'm going to run this wrangle node 
in detail mode. And when you run a wrangle node in detail, it won't actually need any inputs because it's going to write a detail attribute to the exterior of the node. Basically, the detail attribute doesn't need any points or primitives. It just exists on the actual node as part of the geometry data. In fact, you can actually import detail attributes without any geometry at all. It will just work. It's actually a form of data. So over here, what I can do is write out a new attribute. So let's go into the wrangle node and let's type main text as a comment. So this part is going to be for the first entry. Uh, and this is going to describe what mode our tool is currently in. So if we look over here, we have all these options and I would like to show, depending on what mode the tool is in, um, which one this actually is. So we can do this fairly easily. Over here, let's first create a new string attribute called text. And by default, I'm going to give it the text roof props disabled. And then let's add a semicolon because of course it's vex. And then if I apply that, then now you can see that we have a new string attribute down here on our wrangle node as a detail attribute with this text here. And then I want to change this if we have a different output mode set. So let's create a new local variable, an integer called um, output mode. And I'm just going to create a new channel integer parameter for that. So then we can go ahead and plug that up. Let's grab it over here from our props output mode. Copy that. And now let's set up the different modes. So um, let's say if our output mode is um, equal to one. So if it's in the standard instancing mode, then as at text equals unreal instances like that. Then let's copy that. Let's say if it's state two, it's unreal split instances. And then let's um, paste two more copies down below. So that's going to be mode three is going to be our FBX meshes. And in this case, it's going to be our combined generated geometry. So these are the copied meshes, right? And then um, let's copy this again. And I'm going to change this to instanced generated geometry. And we just need to make sure this is set to mode four. Okay, so one, two, three, and four, and otherwise it's zero. So um, over here, if we now change our state then down here, you can see we have a different readout. So that's good. Um, that's what we want. So now what we can do is grab this readout and put it inside of our font node. So let's go back to our font node, add a new spare input again. And this time I'm going to plug in my prop info wrangle. Like so. So this will now refer to negative two, okay? Then in here, inside backticks, so we can evaluate this as an expression, let's type um, details, then negative two, and then within quotation marks, the attribute name we want to grab, which is gonna be text, right? So if we do that, then now this node is going to reference our text attribute from our wrangle and it's going to put it out there. So that's the first line we want to write. Then the next part we want to add is the one for our materials. So in this case, um, we have down here our material dropdown. 
but this one's only available when we are in FBX mode. If we are not in FBX mode, it's disabled, and then I simply don't want to add a readout. Okay, now this is very simple. We can simply add an empty text field as a string, and then it won't output anything. Now this does mean that if we want to have that little dash in front of our text, we can't add it here, because if we do, then it will always be part of that line, right? It will always create a line for us. So instead, what I want to do is add that dash inside of this wrangle node as well. So uh, let's do all this. Let's go in here and let's add a new section. Let's um, add a new comment first. It's going to be the material text field. And I'll just add a little bit of space here. So um, you can always scroll up and down, but at least now I have it at the top of my screen. And then let's add a new string attribute called text material. And this is going to be a empty string by default. So just add two quotation marks. That should do. So with that, we now have a new text material down here with nothing in it. And if we were to read this out over here, then it will simply not create a new line. And I'll show you what I mean. So let's say text underscore material. And there you see, there's nothing changed, even though we do have that line in there. So like I said, if there's nothing in a line in the text node, it won't actually add anything unless there's something in between. And then next, what I would like to add is add a basic readout that says um, dash material with a colon behind it in case we actually do have an FBX file and then we can add the unique piece of text after it. So let's go back and in here, let's say if our current uh, output mode is greater than two, which would be our current um, state here, which is the second state here. So if we are over that, then we are working with FBX meshes. Okay. So in that case, our material should be turned on. So then if we are in this state, I'm going to uh, grab my text mat and I'm going to say dash material and then a colon. So with that now, if our material is turned on, we should have this available. Let's turn this on to FBX mode. And if our material is on or off, doesn't matter, we get that. Now let's grab this and I'm going to tab it over, keep it organized. Then if we are in material mode two, let's add another if statement below this. And you can kind of see where this is going, right? This does take a little bit of time to set up, but it does help you in the end. So bear with me. Um, if our output mode is greater than two and we have our materials turned on, so I need to create a new integer for that. Let's say material mode. If material mode is zero, and then let's grab our interface. I'm just going to move it over here for now, so it's out of my way. And I'm going to copy the material, or the material setting here. Plug that in. So now I can start adding text for that. So let's copy this. And I'm going to change this to text material plus equals. So I'm going to add to that string right visualizer colors and let's see what it does now at the moment it's adding them together so I'm gonna add a space right there okay then let's copy this one paste it down below and if it's set to one I'm going to set this one to um, Unreal Material um, per FBX. OK. 
Okay, so that one works. And then the last one that I want to add is one for the collision. So we have this collision readout. Let's uh, set this up quickly. So let's say collision text s at text call. And by default, that's going to be again an empty value. Go over here, grab that, replace it. Then let's copy this. Make sure we are writing to our text call attribute. And let's change this one to collision. Okay, so now we have the bottom readout. And in case we have the other mode, it's not there either. Then, um, in case we don't have any collision, so let's say we set our collision to no collision, I want to create a readout for that. Let's say we copy this again. In this case, I'm going to say plus equals, and let's set this one to none. And this one's going to happen in case um, our output mode is also with collision mode zero. So let's add a new parameter for that. Call mode should do. And let's grab that and plug it in as well. Um, so now, if it's at the zero, we get this text. Otherwise, we don't. Then um, let's copy this. If it's one, then I want it to be set to um, sourced from FBX. Like that. There we go. So for the other ones, we need to deal with the different type of collision states that we can have. So if we are in FBX mode, so if this mode is turned on, if this is tree, and we are in any one of these, then these ones will be available. So let's set that up next. So let's say for copied meshes, like that, and then let's copy this up here, and I'm going to change this to output mode is equal to tree. So in this case, if we are in mode tree, so before we set it to is greater than two, meaning that either one of these, but now I'm going to say if it is set to copied geometry only, and our collision mode is in a state of two, which we have not addressed yet, so this one, then we should have available our dropdown here. So in that case, we need to add a new parameter as well. Let's say call method. If that is equal to zero. Let's um, go ahead and plug that one in as well. So in that case, we want to set this to new simple collision dash shared. Okay, so now I'm just going to start copy pasting this and I'm going to start filling in the text from my other project because uh, this might take a little bit too much time otherwise. So call method one is going to be new simple collision, multiple collisions per object, like so. Then call method two is going to be new simple collision, unique objects for every collision. Okay, so that will deal with this one, right? So now we can switch it around and that will work. Now let's do the same for the UCX collision as well. So let's copy all of these. Paste them below. 
and if you want you can just add UCX in front of that so uh, you can keep it split in this case if the collision is tree then we want to change this to new UCX Okay, well, almost done. Um, we just need two more, and that's in case we are working with um, packed instances. In that case, we don't actually have our state just yet. We have it for these ones because they're set up here, but not if we're dealing with um, packed instances in simple or UCX mode. So let's grab again from up here one of these. let's say for instanced FBX meshes. If output mode is equal to four and call mode is equal to two, then I'm gonna say new simple collision. Copy that again. And this one's gonna be new UCX collision. Okay, so now we should have a readout for every one of our modes, depending on what we're in. It should all be working. Okay, so at this point, this part should be done. Let's go over to our output here. Let's go over to Unreal and let's test it out. So let's re-import. Rebuild. And now under the prop section, we should have our vent status visualizer here so we can turn it on. And that should give us our readout. Okay, so now we can see the current status of our tool. And let's have a quick test. So if we grab this and we change some of our settings, And now we can see the text does update, just like in Houdini. So that's fine, that's working. So at this point, uh, we have what we need for the visualizers, but there are still a couple of things that I like to do before we wrap up this lecture, and that mostly involves housekeeping. Okay, so let's go back to Houdini, and let's have a look at the remaining tasks that I want to do before we finish up this uh, video. First, there is the matter of dealing with the folder structure of Unreal. Right now, we have a hard-coded file path to our current uh, models, but also to our materials that we're assigning to each element in our database. And this is fine, except that if someone has a different location in their folder structure, uh, such as, for example, if they don't have a meshes folder, but let's say it's called, I don't know, models or mesh, right? Whatever it is then this hard-coded path will break. Now I am going to assume that if you install my tool set, you are going to install my actual um, file structure, which currently has this prefabs and then slash roof in it, unless you personally bypass this, um, this is how it works. And the part that I want to ensure here is that if someone has my folder installed in a different location, then it will always work. Now the game folder here seems to be a standard folder. I mean, if you look in Unreal and you go up to the content folder, that's about as high as you can actually go. So the content folder here is referred to as game when we grab a copy reference from one of our files, like so. But anything under that is basically the same as the file structure we see here. So um, let's set this up first. Let's go over to our tool and I want to add two new parameters to it. So let's open up our type properties. And down at the bottom, under the setup tab, I want to add two new string parameters. Now let's start with the first one for the um, Unreal Meshes path, right? 
let's grab a string and let's drop it below our FBX folder over here. And I'm going to call this one the Unreal Mesh Path. Like so. Under its default value, its uh, channel value, I'm going to grab from over here the meshes section after game and before prefabs. So let's copy that. And everything before meshes, including this slash, is going to stay intact, as is everything after. This is going to be a hard coded path. We're just going to replace this part here. So, um, if this is going to change, then it would be meshes slash something or whatever other folder you're going to store this in. But everything else should be the same. Then um, let's save that. And then let's copy this. Paste it in. And I'm going to grab a separator and put it in between these two. So now I have a secondary uh, path and I'm going to name this one Unreal Material Path or Math Path. Like so. Now as for its value, I'm simply going to grab materials from over here. That will do. So let's apply that. And now if we look under our parameters, we should now have these two available. So we can grab them, copy that, go over to our database over here. And then um, I'm going to say grab the meshes section, paste it in. So we replace that with a um, back ticked expression. And if we evaluate that with minimum mouse click, then we have our full path back here. But it's now dynamic. So if I change this to something else, like meshes2, then now it will reflect that. Then let's do the same thing for the materials over here. Okay, so that works too. And then we'll just have to repeat this for the small vents as well. So let's go over here, grab our meshes path again, paste it over the meshes section. And let's do the same thing again for our materials as well. Now you do need to make sure that you don't mess up the paths here Otherwise, it won't work in Unreal. That's um, very important. So let's go ahead and test this out before we continue. And I'll show you what happens if uh, the paths don't work. So let's save out. Go back here. Re-import the tool. And by default, um, we are currently in FBX mode which means that we are loading our material, right? So we are using this materials folder. So if this material isn't available and we change the folder to say um, materials2, which does not exist, then as you can see, our material disappears and we just get our default Houdini engine material assigned. Now let's switch that back. On the other hand, the meshes folder here is not for FBX meshes, it's actually for our instances. So, Let's switch the tool over to instances instead. And this seems to be working because nothing broke. But if I change the Unreal Meshes path here to something else, then now Houdini will start showing you these little orange cubes. And these simply indicate that the meshes that it's trying to find don't exist. If we scroll down in the list under the uh, instancer section, you will find the orange cubes right here. So if you have any orange cubes, well, that basically just means one of your instances is not being assigned properly, right? One of the meshes cannot be found or potentially one of the blueprints that you're trying to reference or whatever, uh, and it will show you that. 
Now um, let's switch this back around so it isn't broken. Okay, so let's go back to Houdini and I'm going to cover a couple of small potential bugs that um, you might run into depending on what you're doing with the tool. So first, over here on the left, we have the old visualizer for our corners. If we look at that one, and I hide all these other elements for a second, then you see we have these lines here, right? So they all work fine in this particular um, configuration. However, if we were to move some of these walls so close to one another that the tiles themselves have only one tile between them, then this might potentially break. So let's have a quick look at that. Let's grab the parameter interface. And I'm going to change my wall width to something large, like 20. Well, suddenly, all the walls that only have one tile between them now have these um, horizontal lines as well. And that's because of our blast node that we have down here. As you might recall, we took our edge group that we had on these walls and um, we turned it into a selection on our edges, a um, group selection like this. And then we use this blast node to blast away all the elements that weren't in that group. Well, the problem here is that the blast node doesn't work well with edge groups. It works, but only if there is no connecting edge next to it, because otherwise it just doesn't know what it should grab and what it shouldn't, and it keeps both. In fact, the blast node in this case works on the principle of points, not edges. If you want to work with edges, then instead of using a blast node, you can also use a dissolve node. And the dissolve node is much more suited for blasting away anything related to edges. You can also use it to clean up edges on surfaces and any of these other things based on, for example, an angle or to remove inline points. It's actually a quite useful node. Now let's go over here and set up the corner group instead. And let's say delete non-selected. And now we only keep our edges, nothing else. So this is a better alternative than the blast node that we used before. And that's why I wanted to address this. Now uh, let's switch the tool back because I don't want my walls to be this wide. Okay. Then next, let's look down here in our FBX loading loop. And I want to address a situation that might happen if you have an FBX file without its own collision mesh but you are still trying to load the collision meshes of, say, other FBX files. Like, for example, if one of these vents didn't have its own collision and we were trying to use our UCX collision as a complex collision, so this method over here, then in this case, we would run into the problem where some of our meshes will actually have their collision assigned and some won't. So what I would like to do is to create a fallback collision in case our FBX mesh doesn't have its own collision geometry. Okay. Now we can do this in a complicated way or we can do it in an easy way. At the moment, I'm going to keep it simple. So all I'm really going to do is I'm going to start assigning a standard rendered collision geo for the main mesh of these meshes uh, in case the collision mesh is missing. And to do that, we can do this in a rather fast and simple way. So let's create a new switch right below our um, include complex FBX collision merge node, which is where we were originally creating our um, complex collision for FBX meshes. And I'm going to call this switch the bypass missing FBX collision switch. And in case this one is true, I'm simply going to create a new rendered collision geo without simple or UCX behind it, right? So it just takes the original mesh and uses that as a pure collision object as well. It's a fallback in this case, but it will do. 
So let's grab this and let's change it around. Like so. And let's plug it in. So this is going to be option one. So zero is going to be your default. And then uh, one is going to be our backup. Now I want to hook this one up. So it checks if the actual collision over here exists or not. And we can do that by simply creating a um, spare input. So let's do that. Grab this node. And let's reference that. And then in here, I'm going to create a n prims expression. So let's reference this one. And if we say if n prims is equal to zero, so if there are no primitives in our um, original collision, then I'm going to switch this switch to one and otherwise to zero. So with that, if this collision is missing, it will automatically bypass to this one. So let's test it out. I'm going to create a null up here. Plug it into that instead. And now you can see the switch has moved over to grab from our new rendered collision geo over here. So that will work as a backup just in case the meshes that maybe you would try to load like any other meshes are missing and then it will grab that. If you want to set up something like a simple collision geo or a UCX collision geo, you might have to do this both here and down there and maybe work with some more switches or some more complicated setups. At this point, you should be able to do that. You've followed enough of the course here to figure that out, I think. Um, but yeah, this will work as our bypass. And then last but not least, um, let's organize our network a little bit better because right now we have a lot of big boxes everywhere. Uh, but our individual components aren't really specified. They're not really organized. So I'm going to go over here to the right for starters and grab my database. And I'm going to separate this one out. And I'm going to assign them their own netbox specifically for the database. So let's call this one uh, FBX database. And then let's also color it blue. So it's marked as part of our input information. Okay. Then over here on the left, let's grab this part of our netbox. And give it its own netbox over here. You could also put it inside of a subnet if you want to. But in this case, I would like to um, keep everything organized and keep it in the same space. Now the only downside to nesting netboxes like this is that they do become hard to read if you have too many. If this is the case for you, then you can always go and make the background a bit darker. That will make the additive behavior of the netboxes a little bit more easier to manage. And in this case, I'm going to call this upper loop the FBX loading loop. Then down here, let's grab this part of the network and give it its own netbox as well. This is going to be our split um, collision. And then finally, over here, let's grab this section and call this one collision mesh. Now we might update this a little bit more later when we also apply our materials over here. Um, but for now, I think this part of the network is uh, organized enough. So I'm going to leave it here. Okay, so with that, I think we have pretty much finished this part of the tool. I'm just going to save the tool one last time, reload it in Unreal, and double check that nothing has broken. So let's re-import this here. Rebuild. 
and everything still seems to be there. We can also switch the instances. Our readout is changing, so that's fine. And our instances are also still there. So I think this is fine. Okay, so at this point, I think it's safe to say that we have uh, completed this part, this chapter of our lecture. So now we know how to create instances. We know how to set up or recreate our FBX files and load their materials and collisions. We've looked at some more potential uh, visualizers and how to set those up. And we also discussed how to safely update an existing utility node that we were already using inside of our network. Now, in the next chapter, I want to address the elevators and the staircases, and specifically the models themselves. Because at this moment, we are still using these placeholder cubes that just describe their location and their basic shape. But I'd like to go a step further and actually give them their proper models so we can use them, right? Now, I don't actually have a working elevator, but we do have the elevator shaft, and that will be the basic housing for the elevators. And then over here on the right, um, we have an actual staircase that we can actually ascend. So uh, this one will be a working staircase. It will be traversable by the player as well, so the step height will be correct. And if our building scales, then the stairs will also scale as well. So um, this will be functional and interactable, and we can actually go and traverse them if we want to. So let's jump down, and we can then use them to climb back up. And we'll basically be working on this part of our network next. So here in my example file, you can see that we have this section over here. We're going to expand that and we're going to work on the individual components for our elevators and our staircases. So we're first going to build the housing, which will allow us to um, build the basic shape for these elements. And then we are going to expand upon that by integrating a proper staircase that we can then copy into place cover the entire height of the building, and then we'll merge those together at the end. Now, as for the texturing, uh, we are actually going to deal with that first. And I want to address this first because if we don't, then I'm going to have to replace all of these extrude nodes later with the texture nodes. And I'd rather set this up properly right away when we build our staircase and our uh, elevator shafts and all the other elements. Uh, so we don't have to deal with it later. Now for that one, it means that we are first going to create a simple texturing node that's going to allow us to texture a um, surface without extruding it first. And that's going to be relatively simple. And then we are going to look at a more advanced node, which is going to allow us to texture in different ways, using um, different types of patterns, different types of UVs as well. So we can create UV layouts for our different parts of our models, and we can assign textures to different parts of our extrusion as well. So we have the top, the side, and the bottom, each individually. So uh, we'll deal with that first. Um, but for now, I suggest you go to your asset, you make sure it is saved, make sure you save your scene as well, maybe even under a different name, because that's always a good practice. Make sure you make numbered backups as well as the default backup behavior. That's always useful. And with that, um, I think we can wrap up this lecture. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. Um, if you want to show what you've come up with, with your uh, visualizers, feel free to drop by the Discord channel and uh, show it in the show your progress section. And otherwise, feel free to leave a comment, like the video or subscribe. I always like to hear what uh, you guys have to say. So thank you for watching this video and um, have a good one.